Well, we're recording, so um, I believe you owe me a video. I owe you a video, yep. Yeah. I did make a promise that I would record a video on Log Jam. I didn't, I forgot. And then there was Log Jam as well. I don't know if, I don't, did we do a video on Log Jam? If we didn't, I'll do a video on Log Jam. And here we are, we're gonna do it. We're gonna talk about Log Jam. Um, better late than never, Log Jam is an attack from 2015, but it's a bit of a classic, I suppose, in sort of a cryptography uh, world, I think. And it's a really, really interesting one. Logjam is a really interesting attack because it actually has a number of parts, right? So the first part is that you have to do a man in the middle attack on, a, on an exchange, right? And then you have to do a protocol downgrade to convince a server possibly to use a weak Diffie-Hellman key. And then you have to break it using a number field sieve. Right? After you've done that, it, you, all bets are off. You've got, in, you've got all of the traffic from then on. So if we look at a very, very high level overview of how a TLS session works, you have someone over here which is called the client, and someone over here called the server. And this happens every time you go to a website. So you go to any online shop that's hopefully encrypted, this will happen when you start. So the first thing is the client sends over something called a client hello. And this says, I can do all of these algorithms, here's a random number, things like this. The algorithms that they send are usually pretty good because browsers are not stupidly programmed, right? So, you know, they'll say, I can do RSA, I can do DSA, DSA but in terms of encryption, I can use AES, I could use CharCHAR. -char. And, and at some point during this hello, they'll also say, I can use Diffie-Hellman or I can use ephemeral Diffie-Hellman or more recently, I can use elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman. Right? So what happens here is they would send a message that says something like, I can do Diffie-Hellman ephemeral. Right? Now remember, this is from 2015. Diffie-Hellman ephemeral is no longer used. We usually use elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman. Right? And actually one of the reasons is this attack, you know, aside from the fact that it's getting a bit old anyway. Now, what we do as an attacker, so I'm going to get my malicious purple pen, is we intercept this as our man in the middle. So we're a man in the middle here. And we can read and manipulate any of these messages. Maybe we're sitting on a router, something like this. We say, no, no, we're not having that. Right? We rewrite this message to contain Diffie-Hellman ephemeral export. Now, for those of you old enough to know, export grade security was the rules that the US government put in place in the 90s to limit the spread of powerful encryption. So DHE export is a 512-bit Diffie-Hellman key exchange. Now, that would not be considered strong enough. It was still considered not absolutely terrible in 2015, except for the attacks that we talk about in a bit with the number field sieve. Right. So, the server then sees this client hello message and goes, well, this is a bit odd. This client only supports DHE export, but I suppose, you know, it's not an absolute disaster. We'll go with that. And so the server then sends back a server hello and then a number of other messages, including their half of the Diffie-Hellman key exchange. So they send a public large prime number P, the generator G, they send G to the B, mod P, and, and various other things. And they also compute a digital signature and that the whole TLS handshake is quite complicated. But they send a very weak prime number of only 512 bits because that's what the client asked them to do. Now the client actually asked them to send a much better one, but the client gets this message and thinks, well, it's 512 bits, it's not terrible, all right. And they then go, okay, so it's 512 bits, so I'll generate my part of the message and so on. We continue like this. Is the man in the middle just, just listening to all this? The man in the middle is listening in, editing messages where they want, but they don't need to edit these messages yet. All they've done is they've changed the first message to pretend that the client only uh, accepts or can understand export grade weakened security, and the server's kind of gone with it. And at this point, nothing really changes. The client never sees that the server downgraded their encryption. And certainly in TLS 1.2, that's the case. Um, they just notice that the, the, the P looks a bit small. But, eh, right, you know, we, we, we'll move on, right? So they, they continue this, and at the end, they send two messages, one from the client called finished, and one from the server also called finished. Now, those are very important because these messages have a summary of both of these sets of messages. And the reason that exists is because if they didn't, something like this could happen, right? The client has sent DHE, but the server received DHE export. So their two orders of events are different. Right? So theoretically, you shouldn't be able to do this. But here's the problem. If you can break this key exchange at this point here, then you can falsify this finish message and essentially cancel this and send a different finish message. 
that backs up your version of events. That backs up your version of events. So the client then thinks that the server saw very well that it was meant to be DHE, not export, but just sent a rubbishy export key for some other reason. Fair enough. Right? So the question then becomes, how do we break a Diffie-Hellman key exchange in what is, you know, fractions of a second? Right? Well, the first thing is you can't break it in fractions of a second. So what you need to do is you need to buy yourself some time in here. So what you do is to stop a timeout happening, you can wait for a little bit of time. The server's just busy handling other requests or something. He's very slow. The server, for some reason, is on a really weak 3G mobile connection or something like this. So this takes a long time to come through. What happens is the man in the middle will send some kind of TLS alerts or other heartbeat messages that kind of keep this connection alive for a little while. And that will buy you maybe a minute or a minute and a half. And then what you do is you use a number field sieve to break this Diffie-Hellman key exchange. And you have about a minute to do it, at which point you can recompute the shared secret and you can falsify the finished message and then you can read everything from then on. Right? And that is a really, really big problem for any internet communication. And this is true, this is a TLS connection, but this is essentially the same for the internet key exchange that's used in VPNs as part of IPsec as well. Right? So there's numerous protocols that could be weakened if you could break this. So how do we break it? Logjam is an attack on Diffie-Hellman key exchange, basically. And usually Diffie-Hellman key exchange, what happens during, let's say, a TLS, which is HTTPS uh, session, or an internet key exchange, which happens maybe at the beginning of a VPN or something like this. So, you know, it's quite important on the internet for making sure that we get secret keys that we can use to communicate. I mean, the broad attack is based on this idea that you use something called the number field sieve to break a Diffie-Hellman key exchange, but you can pre-compute a lot of the work ahead of time. And that allows you to do a much quicker attack, so we say live. So let's think about what Diffie-Hellman is, very briefly, and how we could attack it. We talked about Diffie-Hellman before with the colors, yes, and we also did a bit of the maths as well. But the answer is basically you have a function called g to the ab, mod p. Now p is a very very large prime number. a and b are secret numbers for Alice and Bob know and g is your generator which is public as well. At the beginning of a session you would agree on a g and you would agree on a p. Now the reason this is hard to break is because you can't take this or any of the other values so for example you also see as an attacker g to the a mod p. Right? We can't take this value that's been sent out in the clear on the internet and find out what a was which we could then use with Bob's public value to create this, this secret, or we could use Bob's little b value to create this secret. Finding out what a is, is called the discrete logarithm problem. And it's thought to, at least, be very, very difficult. That's the idea. And there are variants of this problem that crop up in cryptography all over the place. So, for example, there's an elliptic curve equivalent. Now, the interesting thing about logjam is a strategy for breaking this. Right. If you could break this, then what you could do is you could man in the middle attack something like TLS and basically recompute the secret key they're going to use to encrypt the rest of the session and read everything in the session. Which you could imagine if you were, for example, a nation state doing some sniffing, would be quite a helpful thing to do. So how would you do this? Well, doing this via brute force or some other method, there are various algorithms that make this a bit easier, but none of them make it trivially easy. The best algorithm we know is the number field sieve. Right. Now, I don't really know how the number field sieve works. I don't tend to worry about it too much. It's, it's fairly complicated. But the important thing to know about the number field sieve is it has four stages. Right? There's polynomial selection, there's sieving, there's linear algebra, and then finally, there's descent. That's all I know about it. Right? Now, the important thing, though, is that you can do various amounts of polynomial selection and sieving, and you can do more or less, and it will make your later bits harder or easier or bigger or smaller. And that means that you can pre-compute some of this and then solve it later much more quickly. Right? Key to this is that these first three stages only require the prime P. That means you can pre-prepare all of this based on this prime ahead of time, right? on the assumption that maybe this Diffie-Hellman will be using this prime. What you end up with is a giant table of data, basically, a giant matrix of data that comes out of these three se sections that represents essentially most of the break. Finally, you do it a sense stage, let's keep the letters the same. So using A and the generator G, right? So let's assume for a minute that you and I were going to do a Diffie-Hellman. What would happen was we would agree on a G and a P that we were going to use, and then we'd produce our private A and B values and we'd do the Diffie-Hellman. If we knew ahead of time that this was the P we were going to choose, then you could pre-compute all this 
and then just do this quite quickly. For a short Diffie-Hellman key pair, maybe we're talking about a week for this and a minute for this. Right? For a much longer key pair, we might be talking about a few minutes for this and a year for this on an incredibly expensive server, but within reach of you know, really well-financed attackers. Exactly how the number field sieve works is not really important, actually. What's important is that we can pre-compute a load of this attack so that we can run the actual attack on Diffie-Hellman very, very quickly, almost live, right, when we see an attack. And that helps us do something called a man in the middle when we see a TLS session start up or a key exchange at the beginning of, let's say, a VPN. So how do these link together? Well, if we go back to our Diffie-Hellman key exchange, the problem is that the initial three stages of the number field stiv use P, and P's only been sent by the server here. But the really interesting thing is, everyone always just uses the same P because there's no real added security of using a different one every time. And in fact, using the wrong one can lead to other attacks that are also a big problem. So in fact, it's actually pretty good practice to use similar ones every time. For DHE export grade security, right, Apache had one built in. Right? So an Apache web server would use the same prime every time, 512 bits, if it was convinced to use DHE export. So we, given that we knew that Apache would do this, we would just pre-compute the first three stages of a number field sieve, we'd wait for this message, and then while we were keeping this alive, we would break this using the last descent stage of a number field sieve, right? which is not trivial, you need a lot of cores, but you can do it within a minute, minute and a half. At this point, you can break the whole, the whole um, algorithm. On its own, this is already an interesting paper, but there's, a, there's another half to this paper, which is perhaps even more interesting, because actually, you can't convince every server to use export grade security. Even in 2015, 90% of servers would say, no, no, we're not using a 512-bit Diffie-Hellman key, thank you. We'll use 768 or we'll use 1024. Right? Now that is much harder to beat. So the rest of this paper asks, could you beat it though? Right? Not with a laptop is the answer to that, but how much would it cost and what would the different four stages of a number field sieve look like? What kind of server would you need if you were going to do this for a 1,024-bit prime? There's two questions, really. One is, you know, are most 1,024-bit Diffie-Hellman key exchanges using a similar prime, which means you could pre-compute half of the work or 99% of the work um, using the number field sieve? The answer is yes. Right? And then, given that, how long would it take a server to do this? And would anyone even bother? Right? That's what's really interesting about this. So let's answer the first question. The answer is yes. Loads and loads, at this time, loads and loads of um, HTTPS servers and many, many VPNs, about 80 or 90% of VPNs, were all using Oakley Group 2. Now, Oakley Group 2, the group corresponds to the group of numbers modulo this prime. The prime is 2 to the 1024 minus 2 to the, to the 900, oops, that's not right, 960. Right. Minus 1 plus 2 to the 64 times by 2 to the 894 times by pi, I know it's ridiculous, plus 129093. Right. That is a ridiculous prime number and it has a generator of 2. Right. So that's P and that's G. Now, why this has been determined like this is not of re any real significance. Ba essentially, this is what we call a safe prime. Um, and perhaps that's for a different video. But the point was that many, many internet sessions, particularly on VPNs, were using this exact prime at this time. Because why wouldn't you? It's a safe prime, it's a good one. It's defined in an RFC. RFC, which, well, I've got the RFC here. It's RFC. Um, and that was me thinking that you remembered all that, you know. From... Oh yeah, no. everyone thinks I can just reel off Oakley Group 2. No, no, it's the Internet Key Exchange RFC, which is defined in RFC 2409. Right. Now, it's essentially a standard. And there's a few other primes. There's maybe two or three that most things were using, but huge amounts of VPNs particularly were using this. So then the question becomes, okay, so we've got this prime. We know that lots of people are using it. We know we can pre-compute most of the attack by using this prime only. And then when the actual key exchange happens, we can try and do the last bit. Um, how plausible is that? Well, in this paper, they calculate roughly how much computational power you would need to do this, right? To pre-compute the descent stage, uh, to pre-compute all the three stages and then do the descent stage. And they think somewhere around $100 million of a server. 
in the Edward Snowden leaks, there was a lot of information about various sort of secret things that were decrypting quite a lot of internet traffic. And at the time, everyone looked at this and went, well, you know, it doesn't seem plausible you would, you would decrypt this amount of traffic. Right? But this paper makes a lot more sense of those documents because it suddenly makes you think, well, actually, a nation state, and I'm not particularly singling the NSA out here, right? Any nation state with sufficient budget, these were thousand bit Diffie-Hellman key exchanges are now in reach, right? Because they could pre-compute the number field CIV, and then they could just do the descent stage. So what, what would happen in practice is you would have a bulk sniffing of huge amounts of internet traffic. You'd identify VPN data and you'd send the key exchange off to some massive server to do the descent and work out what was going on while you do this man, man in the middle attack. Or you wouldn't even do the man in the middle attack. You just, because maybe you're not trying to actually inject yourself into the conversation and change all the packets, all you want to do is read them. So you just bulk collect data, bulk break keys, and then bulk read all the information and, and analyze it later, right? Um, and so it's plausible. You know, f uh, as an export grade at 512 bits, you could do it with a powerful server. For sort of 768 bits, you could do it, you know, with a, a very decent cluster of computers, but you know, a sort of university level could, uh, organization could afford it. And then for the thousand bit keys like Oakley Group 2, you would need nation state level resources, but it's doable. This paper was released and obviously they went through proper disclosure, but every single um, browser immediately blocked any export grade encryption. Ogly Group 2 was no longer used almost immediately on, on, in anything. Um, and we now use 2000 bit Diffie-Hellman keys, just like that, because that's how big a problem this is. You know, even if no one was doing this, even if the changes in budget and the Snowden leaks were completely unrelated and had something else to do, had it to do with something else, you still got this kind of what if though question of it's theoretically possible. I always think it's really interesting when, you know, a paper comes out that says this could be a problem and then you sort of find evidence that actually might already be a problem, uh, which I think is really interesting. Now, in practice, we've moved on a few years. It's not been that long actually since 2015. I'm getting a bit old. Um, but since then, we don't use modular arithmetic to do Diffie-Hellman anymore. We use elliptic curves, and we've talked about that. One of the reasons is that the number field sieve in this form doesn't work on elliptic curves, right? So there are various attacks on modular arithmetic groups that don't work on elliptic curve groups, which is why elliptic curves can get away with smaller keys and makes them more efficient. Right? So TLS 1.2 had this vulnerability. TLS 1.3 doesn't support these kinds of Diffie-Hellman. Um, and also, they added in countermeasures in TLS 1.3 to deal with um, protocol downgrade attacks, where you kind of sneakily change a client hello to say something else. The server reports back that that's happened in a way that's very hard for an attacker to avoid. Right? So this had a huge impact and changed the algorithms we use on the internet and TLS handshakes and all of these predefined constants because of just how serious a problem this is. Right. even though a thousand bits at that time was seen as to be totally out of reach of anyone. So really interesting story. So it's, it's sort of for robustness. Now what's happened is the app has gone in, cropped the image down to a much smaller one, which takes up less space in memory. System. These are like kind of engineering-y type things. This one is getting, creating, removing, providing, criticizing. So like for some reason, these types of words